You're already being profiled. The machine is mapping you as we speak. Every pulse, gaze, hesitation, and click. Stitching every micro choice of you into a ghost it can predict before you even act. Such ghosts pervade the web and are the arbiters of what you consume. There's the illusion that we are our own people with modern individualism. The narrative that we are like self-governing atoms, totally in control of our thoughts and actions. But this is a failed myth. No human being lives in isolation from their environment. In a social ecosystem ruled by fancy technological toys, such as the internet, we are largely products of the internet. Once, this ecosystem was closer to the soil that we walk on, but over time we have become increasingly uprooted. The internet is built on code. Not just code as in strings of binary numbers, but the coding of values, beliefs, the encoding that places 50 times more importance on the cultivation of fancy gadgets and the cultivation of compassion within our own hearts. We have collectively chosen quantity over quality. We have chosen speed over depth, efficiency over contemplation. We offer positive reinforcement to those who feed the machine and negative reinforcement to those who question it. And so in turn, we live in a strange state where we are both prisoner and guard. In this video essay, I want to take a closer look at the phenomenon of how technology is encoded. I'll take a look at it through the lens of its multiple dimensions, its design and form, or in other words, what we interact with through our senses in its material form, then its historical and cultural existence, which encompasses the larger systems it operates inside, such as politics and economics, then finally into its inner core, the values and meaning that birthed it. My aim is simply to open up a way of seeing technology, a lens that is multifaceted, not just unilateral. It always helps to go from what is simple before heading to what is complex. So first, let's start with a pen. Now, what do you see? Well, most people might say a pen. You use it for writing, it's small, lightweight. It's too obvious to think about in any other way. And that's exactly what makes it interesting how obvious and unnoticeable it is. If I were to show this pen to an uncontacted tribe in Papua New Guinea, I really do not think that they would see a pen. When I lose my balance, they seem a little reassured. Ghosts don't fall, I guess. He sees Philip, who must look like a strange creature with an eye of a camera instead of a human face. What they would see would be radically different to what we would see, despite it being exactly the same physical object. This is because we are not just seeing a physical object when we look at a pen, we are also looking at a cultural encoding. We were raised in a culture where our parents taught us what a pen was. We use it in school for a particular function. Without even thinking about it, we associate the perception of the physical object with the perception of the cultural object. This is how we're able to register it as a tool. We attribute meaning to the pen. The meaning is something that we have inherited through our culture and internalized for ourselves. As the phenomenologist Morris Merleau-Ponty wrote, language defines itself by the world it subtends. A world including its grammar to be sure, but primordially, a world of meaning. We live in an ocean of meanings. These meanings are dynamic, fluid, and ever-changing. This pen occupies a place in this meaning world. The physical form of the pen, its color, its shape, its texture, material, is only one stratum in the spectrum of meanings. When I hold this pen, 
I'm not only holding its material form, but also its cultural significance as a tool. I'm simultaneously holding the memories of thousands, millions of pens that preceded this pen. I'm holding the legacy of countless designers and inventors. I'm holding the labor of someone who helped assemble this pen in a factory. These are some ways that the pen exists in the worldwide ocean of meanings. But now let's expand this lens using the example of a much more complex tool, the computer. Let us see the computer not only in terms of its form and cultural layer, but reach further to the systems that made it and the values that instigated its birth. Starting again with form, we may ask, how does it engage your senses? It engages my sight through the glow of the screen, filled with icons, text, and images arranged in grids, lists, and infinite scrolls. It engages my hearing through the clicking of the keyboard, the taps of the trackpad, I hear alerts, error pings, and audio through its built-in speakers. I feel the texture of the keyboard keys, the resistance of the mouse, the weight of the laptop under my palms, the motion of my fingers as they dance the movement of the QWERTY design. The computer is designed to be interacted with through our physical senses. The computer's screen and height and keyboard placement dictate how you're going to sit. Shoulders hunched forward, neck angled down, wrists at a certain tilt. The keyboard demands rapid micro movements of our fingers. Our eyes adjust to near field focus, reducing the time spent to distant vision. Similar to a pen, the perception of a computer carries with it a cultural meaning. If you were to show a computer to a peasant in the Middle Ages, it might be seen more along the lines of sorcery. Our modern day eyes, by contrast, are much more familiar. The computer has its cultural roots in the US, with its early momentum appearing in Silicon Valley, California. Computers were first seen as these impersonal calculator-like devices in their IBM era. Few actually recognize how they would shape the world then they started to become marketed to appear more friendly, more personal. You had the computing revolution of the 1970s and 80s, the emergence of Apple and Microsoft as giants. Computers became colorful, they became creative assistants. We began to love our computers. We began to customize them. This cultural shift is encoded in how we actually see computers. We must not forget where the computer comes from. Like the pen, it's made in a factory, assembled by people working a wage for survival. It's owned by a business who competes with other businesses in a competitive market. This is the world of industry. There are the softwares that I run using my computer, owned by other businesses, who profit from my attention. Corporations use these devices to collect, monitor, and analyze large quantities of information. This also occurs with governments at the political level. Now we arrive at the value, meaning-based layer. This answers the question, what were computers made for? What is their point? The purpose is one of efficiency in calculating, communicating, accessing files, and as a housing device for software. The storage system acts as an extended mind where we're able to store memories in the form of photos, notes, documents, individually for ourselves and collectively for the world. It's a synthesis of multiple tools, a typewriter, a television, a database, a library. With this synthesis comes a tremendous power. We're able to manipulate our environment with greater efficiency than ever before. There is the arc of human progress this upward trajectory towards ascending technological complexity and innovation, beginning with Stone Age tools, the development of agriculture, vehicles of transportation, steam-powered motion, electricity and computation. Through a long collective journey of discovery, we have refined our summoning skills. We have developed highly sophisticated toys that enable us to do things with greater speed and power than ever before. 
We can create art that was never before conceivable, accelerate the rate of scientific research to create more effective medicines, but also enact the darker stretches of our imagination. Through the repeated use of technology, we lose sight of its strangeness. We perform, live, and act with technology unconsciously. We forget how the physical interface of the keyboard influences how we type. As Nietzsche wrote in a letter to his friend, reflecting on how his use of the typewriter was altering not just his writing, but his thought process, our writing tools are working on our thoughts. His friend observed how his writing style became more aphoristic and fragmentary when he started writing using a typewriter. Nietzsche was using an early form of the typewriter called the writing ball. At the time it was a new technology. It was strange and different. To think how today the mechanized act of typing on a keyboard, combined with word processors and LCD screens, changed the way that we write. To then think of how the tools we use to write change how we think. This is encoding. Beyond typing, how might our body be encoded? Our neck, spine, our eyes. Then outside of the physical interface, there is the software of the computer. Folders, search boxes, infinite scrolls, and plenty of squares. We forget the way that the Google search engine itself begins to influence how we search and process information. To get on the first page of Google is a kind of digital visibility lottery, shaped by algorithmic logic according to a set of design criteria, as well as monetary influence. The tools of our research in turn shape how we think. The layout of YouTube influences the way we consume content according to its algorithmic function. So in turn, the computer begins to encode us. By fine-tuning our attention to the ways that technology is encoded, we are better able to feel and understand its influence on us. As we live in an environment saturated with technology, these encodings form our ecosystem. If a technological object encoded with the central value of maximizing efficiency and the power to manipulate its environment is increasingly encoding us, we as humans begin to become tools. We begin to become impregnated with the central value of technology. We begin to become programmed for efficiency. We have already been merging with the machine in subtle ways. This reality does not lie in the future. Our tools have been shaping our awareness for centuries. Now, it's only more powerful. From a biological standpoint, one needs only to look at how searching on the internet or social media responds to neurotransmitters and reward-based activation chemicals in our brains. I believe there's something powerful to be said of making the obvious strange again. We are born into this world with a sense of mystery and magic. And then as we learn more and more, what was strange becomes obvious. We become conditioned, hardened. I don't think there's anything to be said that can solve this problem. There is no theoretical solution. Nor is diagnosing the issue enough. I think that the power comes from something that you do not learn. You do not gain as some kind of information. And that consists of the power of noticing. To truly notice technology. Where generative AI can mimic our speech, parody our thoughts. One place we can find some kind of sanctuary is in this capacity to notice. To notice the screen before us in the presence of our awareness as if we were experiencing it for the first time. Thank you.